Okay, here we go. Uh, so this is a an image just showing what happens um, if you do uh, rectangular things in Fraunhofer diffraction. This is still back in the the far figure, far um, far field. It's called. If you do Fraunhofer diffraction with rectangular apertures. Um, and essentially, you can treat the two directions as kind of independent. So if you've got an aperture that has, uh, you know, a B dimension, uh, a BX and a BY, if you like, um, then you just get this usual single slit function each direction according to its dimension. And there, there's nothing surprising about this. And then over here is the kind of result that you would get, a kind of three-dimensional graph of that. And you can see the large central maximum and then these little subsidiary bumps on either side. And there really are, in fact, a whole grid of these. But the, the diagonal spots would be weak on both counts in the sense that they are the product of a uh, a week in the x direction times a weak uh, response in the y direction. So they, they are squared weak in that sense. So they're very, very small bumps indeed, but there would be a whole, uh, a whole grid of them there. And you can do all of this with a more complicated situation. What if you had two slits in one direction, but one in the other? then you just have to work out the whole uh, response function for the two slit direction. And that becomes one of your axes. And then in the other direction, it would just be a single slit kind of response. And uh, change the dimensions of the slit and it changes that particular dimension in just the way you'd expect. There's nothing particularly surprising about this. It can be just rather interesting to try to look at the pattern and reason back to what must be the shape and size of the original slits. How many are there each direction, that kind of thing. Um, you can work all that out. And I've given you one problem like that that'll make you think a little bit. The second figure down here is, is merely the electric field. And so it has both negative and positive and the numbers aren't as extreme, so you can see a little bit more of the diagram easily here. Once you square it, then the big one is that much bigger and the small ones are much smaller and everything is positive. So you can see a little more what's going on, but it's also more confusing. So uh, generally you just look at the intensity and that's certainly what you would see is the intensity. All right, so uh, that is rectangular apertures in Fraunhofer diffraction. Again, that's in the, the far field when you're uh, a long distance away. In a little bit, we'll do the close, uh, close field for rectangular apertures. I have a quick question, John. Sure. Um, like how, what kind of proportion would you need between width and height to start getting something like that? I mean technically a slit would be a rectangle as it would have a height and a width. Yeah, yeah, you, you certainly, uh, it, it just comes down to doing the calculation. Um, so say you've got a slit that's 10 times as tall as it is wide, for example. Mm -hmm. Then what you would expect is uh, this, this the, the pattern in the two directions is just different by a factor of 10. Okay. And, and so, uh, I mean, it's just that simple. If, if you remember, all this stuff is, is, it's inversely proportional. Remember, as you make a slit wider, this pattern gets narrower, but it is, uh, it is proportional in that sense. And, and so uh, that's why we have generally just talked about, you know, slits, tall ones, without saying how tall they are. Well, tall enough that it doesn't matter. Tall enough, mm -hmm that they have a large dimension that way, which makes their, um, their pattern in that dimension small. And so okay. there's essentially no spreading in that dimension, and so we ignore it. 
Uh huh. Yeah. Okay, now uh, I want to go back to a, a topic that really you've seen before, and I'm not going to say really much of anything new. I just want to repeat it all, and that is the resolution of optical systems. This comes up often enough that it's an important point, and, and it relates to what we're talking about here. Um, I don't know how to spell Raleigh here. I was having trouble remembering whether it's E-I or I-E, and I'm pretty sure it's E-I. Um, Lord Raleigh is what that's named after. But uh, if you um, just recall with a single slit of width B, you get this single slit function we've been seeing over and over again. Again, you have to be very far away to see this. The slit has to be quite small, all that sort of thing, at least when you're dealing with optics. Um, the result you get is, uh, is, I mean, it's a single slit function, the sync function, which is sine beta over beta. And beta is defined by KB over sine of theta. The first zero happens when KB over two sine theta, when this whole thing is equal to pi. That's where your first minimum would be right here on either side of the center line. That's the angle theta at which that first minimum would occur. And, uh, that comes out to be the same thing as saying sine theta is lambda over b. If you remember from the plot, we had lambda over b and then two lambda over b and so on were the labeled points down here. Sine theta equal to lambda over b, an easier way of saying that is to just ignore the sine theta when the angles are all very, very small. Sine theta is the same thing as theta, as long as you work in radians. Got to remember to do radians, which I forgot when I was getting this ready. It took me about five minutes to run down what in the world was wrong with my answer. So theta is about lambda over b at those first minimum points. Now imagine that you had a lens here, like they've talked about a couple of times, that if you put a lens here to try to focus this pattern down, um, you, you still, it, it doesn't eliminate the single slit pattern. All it does is focus it nicely. Um, it makes it easy to see the far pattern, but close up. Another way of saying this is if you have a lens, say you've got a lens like this, and you design this lens so that it's not just spherical surfaces, it's the ideal exact surfaces that would cause these rays all to come together to an exact point at the focal length. And you were to put your screen there, you would not see just one perfect point of light. You would still see this single slit function, the single slit being the width of this lens. That effect is still there. The lens would take away the fact that if you didn't have the lens, you'd have just the width of the slit. The thing would be smeared out by the, the plain width of the slit. And that you can take care of with the lens. But this single slit effect is still there. It's always there. And that, in fact, is what limits the uh, how, how tiny a point you can get the light to focus to. And in fact, this is all, any optical system essentially has this. Any optical system consists of a sort of a slit. The lens itself forms an aperture and doesn't allow light beyond it to get through. So there always is that, that aperture. It's normally huge so that you wouldn't think, you wouldn't even think of this effect. We've been noticing it when we have these tiny, tiny slits and we go far, far away, then we see this, this funny little figure. If you have a lens, suddenly now you've got a really large aperture. The lens is focusing things down to a point, but if you put a film there or an image sensor and then look extremely carefully at the figure that you get there, there's still a slight fuzziness and it's all due to the same single slit function, essentially. Now, that ends up 
defining the resolution of the system, defining how tiny a detail that you can see with this system, because everything gets fuzzed out by a little bit. And the way we want to define resolution typically is in an angular sense. So we've got rays coming into a lens like this. And if those rays come in and we focus those to a point, and then let's say that we have a second subject, uh, or a second object, I should say, that's off at a little bit of an angle to the first one. Instead of the rays coming in this way, they're coming in at a bit of an angle. And we want those, of course, to produce another image that is distinct from that first one. And the question is, how close can those two be in angle for us to distinguish the two, uh, the two objects? Stars would be a real simple example. So you've got light coming from two stars. How close together can they be? And you actually can still identify them as two stars rather than just one brighter star. And that leads to the Raleigh criterion. And the Raleigh criterion is, uh, is just simply that if you place, if the response from the two stars, here, here is sort of the slit, uh, single slit function of two stars that are obviously separated. And then as you would put them closer and closer together, these would fall kind of halfway on top of each other until eventually they would merge into a single peak. And you wouldn't be able to see that that was two, you would just call it one, one brighter one. And the question is, well, how far apart do these have to be for you to tell that it's really two and not just one? And Raleigh um, invented the criterion that is the easiest one to work with, and so it's the one everybody uses, which is that when the peak of one of these is right at the first minimum of the other, that will be the limit. If you put them closer than that, then we can't tell that they're two stars. And it's actually a little bit of a pessimistic uh, criterion. You can actually do a little bit better than this, but not much, and it's hardly worth calculating. And so uh, in, in general, people just use Raleigh's criterion. So what that would say is that in a, in a slit system like this, this is our resolution right here, the angular resolution theta just depends on the wavelength and the width of the slit. Now the only thing we have to change, and I'm not going to go through the math, for one thing I don't know it, but um, uh, that this formula is for a slit. So this is really a one-dimensional case where the aperture is infinite in the other dimension. It's a tall slit, uh, infinitely tall. That's not what you have in an optical system you normally have a circular aperture. And in a circular aperture, you, you get the same sort of result. Oh, let's see, does, yeah, here we go. You get this kind of result where there's a, a broad central maximum and then these sort of ghosts outside of it with minimums coming periodically. It looks very much like the same function you get from a slit, just turned into a circle. The only difference is that this first minimum isn't at the distance you would calculate for a slit. And that kind of makes sense because um, if you were to just treat the slit as being the same as the diameter of the lens, that's not quite right because um, if you look in the vertical dimension, there's a whole lot of um, uh, height available in the middle of the lens. And at the top and the bottom, there's only one point. So if you're thinking about how many rays are getting uh, to a particular point, 
from the center versus from the edges, it's not the same distribution as you'd have with a slit. A slit would have the same strength coming from every point along here. And in a lens, you've got far more coming from the center than you do from these extremes. With the results, you get largely what looks like the same pattern, but it's scaled a little differently, as if the slit were slightly narrower than this. The final result is just this simple formula right here. So for a circular aperture, the, the Raleigh criterion is that the angle is 1.22 lambda over D, D being the diameter then of the lens. Oh, I should say that uh, you'll, you'll find this terminology all over the place in uh, HECT. But uh, from a circular aperture, that central maximum area, that blob, is called the airy disk. A-I-R-Y. I think that's a person's name. Uh, I don't know who it was, but anyhow, somebody named Airy. Um, and the airy disk is considered to go all the way out and, and be bounded by that first minimum. So essentially what we're calculating here is the radius of the airy disk, if you like. This theta would be the angular radius of the airy disk. So 1.22 lambda over d. Now next, I just did a quick little calculation. This is where I made my mistake, but I fixed it now. So what about the I? What is the uh, resolution of, uh, of an ordinary human eye. Pupil is on the order of five millimeters. It can be larger, especially for younger people. Um, and, uh, but I just picked that as a reasonable number. And a wavelength of 550 nanometers. And if you just go through this calculation, remember that the answer you get here is radians. So 1.34 times 10 to the minus four Probably can't quite see that as a four there, but that's what that is, 10 to the minus four radians, which I then converted is 0 0.0077 degrees. Or changing that to arc minutes, multiply it by 60 and you get 0.46. Now remember you did a lab in which you were trying to measure the resolution of the eye and we, I think, generally reported, I think I asked you to report your answers in arc minutes. And you were getting something less than one arc minute in all cases. Uh, and it was around a half or something. So what this suggests is our eye is very close to the theoretical limit. Now remember, this is the Raleigh criterion, which is a little bit pessimistic you can do a little bit better than that. Um, I don't know exactly how much. It's not a factor of two. It's not off by a factor of two. Um, it, it might be 20 or 30 percent that you could do better. So that would give you a number that might be slightly smaller than this. But um, what that means is you, if you take you know, an eye and replace it with perfect optics somehow and a perfect sensor behind it, you, you can't get much higher resolution through that size pupil. Um, if you want to get better resolution, you either have to change the pupil size to be larger, or you have to go to a different wavelength. Work at um, some shorter wavelengths would be, would be better. We should be able to see more fine detail in blue light. Now, in fact, we probably see worse detail in blue light for other kinds of reasons. Our sensors aren't as uh, finely distributed in the blue end. The other thing, keep in mind that this is the theoretical uh, minimum, the, the theoretical uh, best resolution you can get. You may well find with a camera, for example, if you've done photography um, and you're trying to take a really good picture and you want fine detail and you focus the best you can, you may well find stopping the aperture down to a smaller aperture gives you finer detail. 
Why is that? Well, it's probably because your the lens in your camera isn't perfect. It's not limited just by this. It's got aberrations in it. And the minute you have aberrations, then usually those get worse and worse the larger you make the aperture. And as you stop it down, things get a little better. Even our eyes have some of this effect, so that when you open your pupil wide open, you can't see as well, which is why people often squint, especially if, you're, uh, if your eyes uh, don't have, um, if you're a little bit nearsighted or something like that, then squinting can help you enormously because um, you're, you're essentially creating a pinhole camera at that point. But if your eyes are truly, um, uh, not ideal, but at least uh, not needing correction, then squinting probably won't help you much if it does at all. Um, and in a camera, presumably as you stop things down, it would get better for a while. And then if you stop down too far, you would start seeing this effect and things would get worse again. There's probably, uh, you know, for each lens, there's probably an ideal aperture. I don't know what it would be. But uh, this is sometimes called the, uh, the diffraction limit. And you can speak of whether optics are diffraction limited or not. Are they perfect to the point where the only thing that limits their resolution is this diffraction effect? Um, and so like a, a, a good telescope would be diffraction limited. Um, in uh, general physics, uh, uh, we often did the, the calculation, I assume I did it for you guys as well, about uh, putting a satellite in orbit and seeing what kind of resolution it in principle could have uh, when, when you look at uh, images of things down on the earth, you know it's gotta be a certain distance away and uh, the question is, can you, can you read a license plate? That's the way I usually state it. Uh, can can a, a satellite in orbit using a camera of some kind read license plate numbers? And you can pretty quickly come to the conclusion that they cannot, um, that that is beyond uh, the capacity of optical systems because if you calculate the, the necessary diameter of the lens using visible light, um, you, you come up with a diameter, a needed diameter of something like 10 feet um, or larger. And uh, what I think, actually, I think we came up with 10 meters. Usually came up with about 10 meters. And uh, you just know, well, there, there's nothing up there that big. Um, the Hubble telescope is what 2.4 meters, I think, in diameter, and uh, you can decide what you think the uh, spy agencies have up there. If you're a cynic, you say probably three meters. <laughs> if you're, um, and it, it's quite. I've I've read hints here and there that they probably have something very comparable. To, to Hubble uh, up in orbit, but uh, I don't know that for sure. Nobody does except the people involved. Um, but even, even Hubble would not be able, even, even something the size of Hubble would not be able to, uh, to read license plates, but they can come close. They can come darn close. Uh, they can certainly see the license plate. Um, and that means they can easily see, see people. Anyhow, all of this just comes about uh, just just looking at this very simple formula. You can do the same thing with the James Webb if you want and figure out, well, what kind of detail could it see? Or another kind of question is um, the, the astronauts landed on the moon. Uh, when, when people claim that, oh, that was all just faked, why don't we just have one of the big telescopes take a picture of the landing site? and show us all here, here's the, here, here's the picture of the Apollo 11 uh, 
the, the bottom stage that's still there and the flag that's planted on the moon and all this sort of stuff. Well, you can do a quick calculation and show that any picture from Earth of any telescope we have right now would not show you those kinds of details. It would not be able uh, to see things in a convincing way. Not that that would convince anybody anyhow. Um, a picture that came out of a, uh, a big telescope I don't think would help uh, resolve that. If you're, if you're willing to believe conspiracy theories to the extent that Apollo was a fake, then a couple of pictures from a large institution aren't going to convince you otherwise. But, uh, but anyhow, th this kind of calculation you can quickly go through and determine the, uh, the resolution of circular apertures very easily. All right, uh, I think we'll go on and get to the really hard topic for today. This is going to be a challenge, but I want to talk about Fresnel diffraction from rectangular apertures, and I'm afraid I'm going to blow you all away, but got to do it. So get ready for a little ride here. So we're going back to uh, rectangular apertures again, but in this case, we're going to be looking at the near field. Uh, hence, this is Fresnel diffraction, not Fraunhofer diffraction. So here's our case. We're going to do something. It's going to end up kind of similar to that vibration curve. And the math is even worse, I would say. Um, so we'll see if we can get through this in a way that you can follow. So here's our rectangular aperture. And Y and Z are the axes that define the aperture. We've got a source point out here at a distance rho, and the, uh, I don't know what he calls this point, the, uh, what should we call it? Um, the image point, maybe, I don't know. Uh, P over here, it's a distance R. So you've got rho and R as the two dimensions. And uh, we will be looking at the contribution from little pieces of the opening that are at uh, coordinates uh, y and z, and ultimately it'll be dy and dz that will be integrating over this whole aperture to get the contribution that comes together and interferes and creates uh, whatever we see at point P. Okay, that's the setup. Now, I'm, I'm just going to take you through in broad strokes. And uh, you can read the details in HECT. Here are, are my notes that start setting it up. So uh, this is the intensity at that point P again. It's a little bit of intensity that comes from little, a little bit of the source in here. It's got a bunch of factors out in front that are hard to actually understand all of the details. The obliquity factor is in here. Um, then uh, this is the source strength. Uh, rho and R are in here which reflect the fact that the further away you get from the source, the weaker it gets. And then when you scatter further from that point, then it de again decreases as uh, this distance r. So that's what those two factors are. Although we're soon going to replace them with rho zero and r zero and ignore the slight change. And then there's the phase, which is what it's all about, really the phase that we get at this point, which depends on k times rho plus r, the actual distance we're going. And there's always the time as well, omega t. We aren't going to do anything with that. That just turns out to sit out in front the whole time. But it's k times rho plus r. That's the factor we're going to spend most of our time working with. Now we have to work out what these path lengths are. So that's what I'm doing right here. 
Should I zoom in, I wonder? I've got some really small writing. I think I better zoom in a bit. Uh, there we go. Is that better? Should I go further? I probably could. Would you like to see it further? Nod your head if you would. Uh, okay, we'll leave it there. Good enough for now at least. Okay, so looking at rho and r, which are these, these two distances, the actual path distances. Rho zero and r zero are the straight through path that we sort of compare things to. And rho and r are the actual path. And it depends on rho zero. Rho depends on rho zero and y and z being the coordinates of where we are in that little spot. y squared plus z squared. Um, this is essentially just Pythagorean theorem in three dimensions. You've got a, a, a weird sort of a hypotenuse-like path with three dimensions to it instead of just two. So it's rho zero squared plus y squared plus z squared. And r is the same thing with r zero squared plus y squared plus z squared to the one half power. And then because this is a physics derivation, we have to use the binomial expansion. And uh, so uh, remember 1 plus x to the power p is 1 plus p times x. So instead of taking these things to the 1 half power, let's just multiply y squared plus z squared by 1 half. Before doing that, I divided by rho 0 squared so that I have y squared plus z squared over rho zero squared, so that that's a small number, because the binomial expansion only works with small numbers. And then I also have a one left over here. That just puts it into the right form to use the binomial expansion. Does that kind of make sense to you? You don't need to know all the details. Do the same thing with r zero. So then our total path becomes a row zero. You get a row zero from here. You get an R zero from here. And then you get a one half Y squared plus Z squared. And then what's left is a one over rho and a one over R. I'm not sure why those aren't squared. Oh, because there's a row zero out in front that multiplies each of those. Yeah. So it become just one over rho and one over r. And uh, then, I don't know if you know this little trick when you've got um, one over rho plus one over r can be rewritten in this fashion as the sum divided by the product. That's just uh, putting them over a common denominator. Next, we want to get the phase of these things. That was just distance. So the phase would be uh, a row plus or the distance divided by the wavelength times 2 pi. So here's my phase, 2 pi rho plus r, and just writing all of this out, that's what I'm going to get. That then becomes, uh, here is k, so 2 pi over lambda, I just rewrote that as k, and rho 0 and r 0, this stuff we're going to pretty much ignore because that's just a constant phase. It's the same phase for everything. What we care about is how the phase changes for different parts of the figure, for different y and z. As you move around in that aperture, how does the phase of each contribution change? So we're going to be looking at this section in much more detail. <laughs>
So uh, just to uh, rearrange things ever so slightly, we had y squared plus z squared. Now we're going to separate the two terms, have a y squared term and a z squared term. And it's kind of a mess. Uh, so pi over 2, and then there's a 2 in here, a row 0 plus r0 divided by lambda row 0 times r0. But if you look, all of these are constants. It's only y that's varying. These are a bunch of constants. And so the choice is made to rescale the whole problem in terms of new variables. And for whatever reason, people still keep the pi over 2 in here and have pi over 2 u squared plus pi over 2 v squared, where u and v are then essentially replacing y and z. They're just rescaled versions of y and z. All right. And is that is that mostly just so you don't have to keep writing it out? It is entirely for that reason. Yes. Okay. That's all it is. This this is standard in derivations like this. You get tired of writing a whole bunch of junk, so you redefine things and 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 you should get used to doing that. Uh, it is the only way to keep your sanity in these kinds of things. If you keep writing out huge long messes, all you do is make mistakes. You also lose track of what's going on and and when you when you rewrite it that way you realize oh the phase has a constant out in front and then it's proportional to u squared plus v squared oh okay well that's much simpler to sort of keep in mind and think about what's going on than all of this trash here so Okay, um, now it's time to actually set up the full integral. We've just been talking about phase with the thought that maybe we would put this at some point into the integral. So we're going to add up all the little pieces, DE. If you remember way back up here, I defined this whole thing, DE, in terms of this phase. So now I'm going to stick the phase back in and calculate this DE. And we're going to ignore most of the constants out in front of this thing. We just don't care about that. Uh, all of those would just go into figuring out what the I0 is. Um, furthermore, we are going to approximate, uh, for instance, out here, rho and r as being essentially equal to rho 0 and r 0 for these purposes. We'll approximate the obliquity factor as just being one. We're going to ignore that entirely for this derivation. And so then you end up with all this junk out in front. Notice I brought out the e to the i omega t because we don't care about that either. All this stuff that's floating out in front. Uh, inside is the expression for the phase right here. This comes from the line right up here, except with u and v substituted. So here's that line, here's the u squared, and here's v squared. And I went ahead and distributed my i in each of these instead of having i times the whole thing. And the, the this is incorrect. I still have it dy dz. This needs to be changed so that it's in terms of du and dv. We need to change the variable of integration so that everything's consistent. And that's what I've done down here. I pulled the constant term here out in front also. And then I've rewritten these in terms of du and dv. It just brings in another batch of constants, which I include in the stuff out in front. So we've got these integrals of e to the i u squared, e to the i v squared dv. 
what are those? Strangeness. Haven't quite encountered those before. That's not a usual kind of expression. So let's look at those in a little more detail. Here is just the first one, just the U. Doesn't include the V at all. We're going to take these kind of one at a time. E to the I pi over two U squared du. And it's going to have limits, just as the original uh, integral would have had limits on, uh, what was it, Y or Z. You would have gone from Y1 to Z1 in order to cover the range of the aperture whatever the size of the aperture was would have been defined in terms of y. Well, now it would be defined in terms of u. You just have to rescale and, and find out what u1 and u2 are. e to the i something is the same thing as cosine something plus i sine something. So this turns into two integrals a cosine of u squared and a sine of u squared. And now to understand these, we're going to define what are called the Fresnel integrals. Fresnel apparently is the first one who went through all of this. And we'll call one of them the C of W. W becomes the variable. It's sort of a placeholder. <coughs> it is either u or v, which you recall were rescaled from y and z. But for either one, the c function is just the integral from 0 up to w of cosine pi over 2 x squared dx. This x is not this is just a placeholder x. has nothing to do with the x-coordinate in this problem. It's just a placeholder. This is just explaining what this function is, and that x will be gone from the result. It's a function of w. Do you see that? And in the same fa fashion, the s integral, c and s just stand for sine, and, uh, cosine and sine is defined as the integral from 0 to w of sine of pi over 2 x squared dx. With those definitions, you can now rewrite the original that we had up here, e to the i u squared, as being c of u2 minus c of u1 plus i s of u2 minus s of u1. If you have these functions defined, you can write them in those terms. And interestingly enough, in some of these mathematical packages, they have the Fresnel integrals defined. Um, I've forgotten what I was working in one time. I think it was Mathematica. And they were there. So you could just, uh, you could just use them. That was great. They're just like, you know, hyperbolic cosine or something like that. They're, they're just sitting there waiting to be used. If not, uh, Hex has a little table if you guys want to do things really old school. Um, he's got a table of their values somewhere. I don't remember where. Be in the Fresnel part. Yeah, well, anyhow, I won't try to find it. You guys are never going to use a table. Okay, now uh, going back to the original expression, which had both u and v, if you were to write the whole thing out, it would be this big mess. So it's all written in terms of these Fresnel integrals. c of u minus, uh, c of u2 minus c of u1 plus i, s of u2 minus s of u1. All of that has to do with the horizontal dimension of the aperture and then the vertical dimension of the aperture would be in terms of these Vs. Um, and I see I've got a mistake here. This is a C and a C, and this should be S over here. These need to be 
S's. Okay. Now, if you think about this, uh, you realize that the C and the S functions act a little bit, uh, well, they, they are like the uh, real and imaginary parts of the complex number we're getting over here. And what we ultimately want for this E that we're getting is the magnitude in phase. And in fact, what we mostly care about is the magnitude of this thing. And so it turns out we can graph this thing in a very clever way, sort of like that vibration curve. And we will use the C of W to be the real part and S of W to be the imaginary part on, these, on, on the X and Y axes of a graph. And we'll graph these against a parameter W. Um, which is a, a sort of a function of the original y or z. You, you do this generally just in one dimension or the other. Um, you don't actually work with both dimensions. So uh, w is either something to do with y or something to do with z. And you look at uh, maybe the width of, um, uh, and you just look, you, you generally work in one dimension or the other. We've sort of developed this whole thing as if you were going to go both ways, but you don't ultimately end up doing that. But W is this coordinate that depends on Y or Z. And then you make this fantastic graph. All right, let's see. I'm going to keep these sort of in order. Well, first, let me show you, I should have showed you this before, what these integrals look like. So here is what the C integral looks like. This will be the real part, ultimately. So if you just graph cosine of pi over 2x squared, it, it looks like this. And then you're ultimately going to be integrating that from zero up to some value of w to get this c function. So you're taking the area under the curve. And you can see that's going to be rising as you integrate up to here. And that's where it reaches a peak. Stops rising. And then it's going to start falling as you accumulate area under the next part of the bump. But the area under here is less than what you had there because of the x squared, this thing, um, yeah, it, it rapidly gets compressed. And so this thing oscillates and sort of peters out, but stays at a value of 0.5. That's what you get from the c function. Meanwhile, the s function looks like this. This is a sine wave that we've now squished by this x squared factor. And when you integrate that in a similar fashion, you go up to a peak, that peak would line right up with this zero. And then you start oscillating again about, about this point one half. Okay. Here, then, is the Cornu spiral. And this is graphing C on the x-axis to be the real part, and S on the y-axis to be the imaginary part. And W is the parameter that takes you along the curve. So, W stands for either U or V, which came from either Y or Z. So if your slit goes from, you know, minus 0.1 up to 0.2, then you take those 
x or y and z values convert those to u and v uh, well let's we're these are, are let's say these are just both y values we're only working in y but we've got two numbers for the two bounds of the slip the two boundaries then um, you convert those into from y into u and then u uh, takes the place of w. And so you'll have numbers that you can find on the curve here. And maybe you went from 0.4 to 1.2. Those were the two boundaries of your slip. And so 0.4 is here. That's a negative 0.4. And up here is the other boundary is 1.2 or something like that. So up here. And what this gives you essentially is a kind of phase diagram for the electric field. These are all little bits of the phase diagram. And so the resultant field is from one end to the other. And so you draw a big vector and that's the strength of the electric field for that opening. Isn't that bizarre? Now here's the tricky part. Okay, let's say we had a symmetric slit and we were in the center of it and we went from 0.5 to minus 0.5. So we would have an electric field just like this. Nice strong electric field. Now what if we're a little off center as we move our observation point, that effectively shifts the place where these two limits are. From our observation point, we would have a new center line and the limits of the slit would be defined a little differently and they would just shift along here. And you see how, okay, you'd still get a nice strong field from here. Keep going further away and this starts wrapping around up here and you'll get less and less and less coming out of your slit. And so it just shows you how the, um, how the electric field would drop off as you got further away. But it also can give you oscillations. of just the kind that you will see. Here, here is the kind of thing that you get from a slit. And what's happening here, here's the, here's the diagram down below. He does the diagram. And so this is a fairly wide uh, slit. And then as you get into one part or the other, this thing curls around. And so that end of it starts oscillating back and forth. And that's what these oscillations are here. Well, uh, our time is essentially up. I'd like you to take a look at this. There's a whole lot in the chapter. He does a bunch of examples of this. See if you can get through it. But I want you to also observe it. He's got one tiny little paragraph in here that you must not miss. And that is, he talks about, on page 519, this is one of the things I love about this book. To observe Fresnel slit diffraction, form a long narrow space between two fingers held at arm lengths, make a similar slit close to your eye, and look at some bright like the sky or something. I find it works a little better with a card. So get yourself a card and make a slit, a fairly narrow one, uh, two or three millimeters in width. Hold that at arm's length. I'm gonna switch cameras here. So you, you hold that card at arm's length and then have a second card with a much, much finer slit in it. I just cut a real narrow one in there. 
And that should be about half a millimeter though. The one that worked best for me was about half a millimeter. So two millimeters versus half a millimeter. The tiny one goes right up next to your eye and the other one goes far away. And then look at the sky. And if you look carefully at the edges of the large slit as you're looking at that, the edges of these lines, you, you'll see that bright sky and then darkness on either side. But look carefully and you'll see fringes. So try that one out and see if you can see Fresnel diffraction just with, uh, well, you can try it with your fingers too. That's what he suggests, but I think you'll have a little better luck if you use a, a card. So read that section and uh, the problems I want you to do are, um, are the following. There's six problems. So if you're ready to write these down, 28, 38, 46, 72, 73, and 90. 28, 38, 46, 72, 73, and 90. I think I already gave you 72 and 73. So uh, number 90 is the Cornu spiral. Um, I guess I didn't mean that thing. That weird spiral is called the Cornu spiral. So uh, see if you can get through that one. That will be uh, a bit of a challenge. The others are a little more straightforward, I think. All right, that does it. I think we'll see you on, um, on Monday at, uh, at our usual time of 2 o'clock. Does anybody have any further words? Okay. Have a good weekend. We'll see you then.